Hello, my name is Brian Butler. Uh, Frafi Kreider and I are co-directors of the University of Maryland Social Data Science Center, or SODA, and we welcome you to the launch of the center. Frafi? Warm well, welcome also from me. Uh, everybody who was joining us yesterday already um, might have seen the fun we had uh, digging into social data science and health. If you missed yesterday, uh, please visit our website and uh, watch the recordings. And I uh, also want to mention a, spe a specific welcome to our friends uh, watching the launch from Europe. We saw some activity on Twitter documenting that our Twitter handle, if you want to follow for today, is at Soda UMD. Thank you all. Yeah. yeah. So uh, effectively and efficiently and ethically creating high quality information products about human activity is absolutely critical for health, education, climate, entertainment, policy making, business, government, and any number of other areas. Uh, addressing the unique challenges of working with social data at larger scale, uh, broader scope, and in novel ways requires a multidisciplinary community of researchers and professionals, and that's exactly what SODA aims to be. Uh, the University of Maryland Social Data Science Center leverages UMD's substantial strength in survey methodology, measurement, information management, visualization, and analytics to address these challenges and realize the potential of social data to change the world. Um, as part of this launch event over a three-day period, we're on the second day, we'll be discussing the role of social data science uh, in three areas, health, as Sparkle mentioned, we talked about yesterday, business and economics today, and tomorrow we'll have a panel uh, looking into privacy issues. Today we're going to consider issues and opportunities at the intersection of social data science and business and economics. <clears throat> We're excited to have as our moderator, David Lotion, who's a faculty member at the College of Information Studies and the director of the Masters of Information Management program. David is a experienced researcher and, and consultant in the area of information and data governance, uh, having worked in that area for several decades, uh, working with both companies and federal agencies in a wide variety of ways to help them better use data to support their mission. So I'll now turn things over to David, who will introduce our speakers and lead today's discussion. Thank you, Brian. Uh, welcome to day two of the Social Data Science Center launch event. Today's topic is social data science and business and economics. And we have three distinguished panelists who are going to discuss different aspects of the use of data analytics and how it integrates with business and economics thought processes. We have Lori Perrine from the UMDI School Julia Lane from NYU and Catherine Abraham from the Economics Department in the College of Behavioral and Economic Sciences, also here at UMD. Each of our panelists is going to share their current work and then we will have time for audience questions. I want to point out that there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can type in your question and please indicate whether your question is for a specific panelist or for all the panelists. We're going to start with uh, Lori Perrine. Lori Perrine is a former technology policy advisor in the Clinton administration and has led a number of international technology alliances. Uh, now, uh, Lori is a lecturer and a PhD student at the College of Information Studies, and is also a research fellow at the Advanced Information Collaboratory. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Lori. Thank you very much, David. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joining us here today. Um, I'm going to take us today through a brief overview of what we can anticipate as potential data-enabled opportunities to create um, and to incorporate uh, social value, social change, and sustainability into the frameworks that we use to develop, implement, and evaluate technology policy. And so um, let's actually talk a little bit about what technology policy is. Um, let's understand here um, what we typically address when we're talking about technology policy. Uh, while this to-do list is US-centric, it's actually quite comparable to what one would find in a technology policy agenda uh, for any high-tech, innovation-driven economy. And what you'll notice is that technology policy includes elements that address people, infrastructures that are both technical and non-technical, and core technologies that allow scientific discoveries to be transformed into value, both economic and social value. 
when we think about models of policy making, um, we should understand that those models are very much theoretical representations. Um, ideally, when we're making policy, we have a process that is evidence based, has input and engagement from key stakeholders, including the public, and allows us to evaluate um, the extent to which we've accomplished our policy goals. Um, as we all know, the actual process is considerably more messy, more complex, more dynamic, and subject to political agendas of all stripes. When we talk about technology policy, we add a, another layer of complexity and dynamism um, that brings a very particular, very particular character to that um, set of policy making and policy decisions. While these ideas of complexity, novelty, agility, globalization, um, the, persuas the um, pervasiveness of technology are not necessarily new or unique to policymaking, they certainly do shape the extent to which we can transform uh, discovery into value. Now, uh, this is uh, sort of the, the typical picture you'll see um, in any situation where people are going to say, you know, big data is going to totally transform um, what we're doing. And yes, big data um, has the possibility of totally transforming the policy cycle, in particular, the policy cycle for tech policy. And in what ways, how can we expect that transformation to occur? Well, what you see here are just some examples, and those examples um, help us to see that we've got emerging possibilities, uh, first of all, for actually articulating what value is um, in new contexts to identify value and opportunities for value creation for, um, for many actors of innovation to participate in value creation and to capture that value in a way that benefits broader segments of society. So if we take a moment to look at um, a slightly different conceptual model for how we do evidence-based informed policy, um, looking at the idea that there's an agenda setting process, policy formation itself, using the evidence that comes into the system, the actual implementation of the policy, and then looking at our policy outcomes. Um, let's take that framework and look at where we might enhance it by incorporating some of these data-enabled dimensions with a particular focus on the idea that we've got opportunities to capture value and create value that are now dynamic, open, multifaceted, and adaptive. So if we look at the evidence um, element um, of our uh, policy making, we see that we've got new opportunities here to um, collect information, to qualify from whom that information is coming in, and also, of course, because we're talking about data and get data analytics, how we analyze that. And that's information and that's evidence that we're collecting, not just for agenda setting, but for formulating the policy itself. Um, here we see the possibility of new actors, new analysis, new data coming in to shape that agenda, coming in to give us a new set of options as we look um, at the policies that we set forth. The engagement that is possible now allows us to reach beyond the traditional communities of technologists and the traditional sphere of business to really look at the communities that are impacted by technology, the communities that co-create technology, and to look at the ecosystem in which technology occurs, the natural ecosystem, as well as the business and the social ecosystems. It also gives us an opportunity to begin being explicit about whose motivations, whose norms, and whose values we include in our public policies and towards what goals uh, we are, or whose goals uh, we are attempting to optimize in these situations. When we look at the evaluation process, of course, that's a place where we typically see low-hanging fruit with the inclusion 
of new data analytic processes, but also with the possibility of getting in, once again, new information. But even more, we're able to perhaps identify what innovation means in a much broader context, to be able to look at social and civic innovations that aren't necessarily captured um, in the old system, um, to look at process innovations and to look at impacts beyond what is immediately visible, to look at secondary impacts and tangibles, and of course, to look at what is the impact on society, on environment as well. We can also begin to quantify where there are externalities and also to predict the emergence of externalities that may be harmful and perhaps to mitigate those in a proactive way rather than in a way that seeks to remediate harm. And finally, we're able to address a time dimension here uh, where there is the opportunity for us to be more agile, more innovative, more adaptive um, in the way that we make policy, but in the way that policy can respond to challenges as well. So I have to add here a caveat, um, a reality check. When we think about the ways that we can incorporate these technologies into the policy cycle, what we have to remember is that many of these technologies that we're looking at at the moment, the ways that we incorporate social data, the ways that we're using AI and machine learning, all of those things are technologies that haven't quite gotten through to their maturity. And so uh, what we're going to want to um, bring in to the process is a certain idea that um, even as we incorporate technologies, we realize that we're going to have to have, um, we're going to have to be mindful of a certain adaptiveness as technologies um, evolve um, and as technologies fall away and new technologies emerge. So what we're going to need to do at this point is to really think about defining where those opportunities are and figure out how we can operationalize and manage those. And then look at where are the gaps now between where the technologies um, are in their own um, technology development cycle um, and where those tools and methods are and what we need. And then also look at some of the people dimensions about how we use how we build capacity in order to take advantage of those opportunities. And so with that, I'm going to conclude my uh, presentation. I look forward to your questions and I'll turn uh, the uh, session back over to David. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, and just a reminder, if you have questions, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can type in your question and, uh, and please indicate uh, if you want to direct that question towards one of our panelists. Uh, our second panelist today is Julia Lane. Julia is a professor at the NYU Wagner Graduate School of Public Service and is a senior advisor in the Office of Federal CIO at the White House, supporting the implementation of the federal data strategy. Julia co-founded the Collagen Initiative, whose goal is to use data to transform the way governments access and use data for social good through training programs, research projects, and a secure data facility. The secure data facility was initially built at the behest of the Census Bureau to inform the decision-making of the Commission on Evidence-Based Policy. Julia? Um, hello. Let me just uh, get my screen shared. And uh, so thank you very much for the introduction. And um, I, I want to say that uh, I'm thrilled to be participating in this launch. I'm a huge fan of what's being done here, of the work that Frauke and jo Jody and so many of you have been doing. I think it's such a timely activity to be uh, working on. So, um, so kudos to all of you. And um, I just, I think it's super important um, for, and I'll talk about um, my perspective, uh, and I'll very much look forward to your comments. So um, the reason that I think uh, having a center with the focus that, um, that, that this center has is uh, critical for understanding how we're 
producing public data for um, business and economics is I think our current data infrastructure has a, a lot of major challenges. So I'm going to kind of tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. So, um, so we, the, the federal statistical system and to some extent the um, programmatic uh, agencies are uh, treasure troves obviously of data. Um, and as you are probably well aware, uh, under serious funding stresses, and uh, I think have struggled to innovate in the same way that the private sector has been able to innovate. And I think what we're facing now, and I think what the center is looking at is we've got massive technological change and, and uh, the role of universities and think tanks and, and the, in the scientific community is to really help rethink how we're doing uh, data collection, access, and use um, for the public data sector because public data is absolutely critical to the foundation of a, of a democracy. Um, but bringing together the data isn't the only thing that needs to be done. Um, we need to build the skills, which again is what the center is about. And we need to think about how to use uh, these new tools uh, not just to be able to work with the data, but to be able to collaborate and replicate the work that uh, that that can be done. And so, um, I'll close when I when I get to the end with a book that we I just put out that um, is called Democratizing Our Data. And I think part of what I'm uh, thinking about here is how can we rethink the organisation. Uh, the training and the engagement of the way in which we currently produce uh, data in the United States. Um, so how can data science like the work that is being done here make a difference? And so when I first started writing uh, this book, uh, I went back to one of my favorite people of all time, and that, that's Janet Norwood, who was BLS commissioner um, uh, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, she makes the case for why public data and why evidence is so important. And I think that's obviously very true, as true now, if not more true, uh, than, than the things that she pointed out 25 years ago. Um, and she also points out in her book, um, which was called Organizing to Count, um, the challenges that our public data system faced 25 years ago. So this is in Bill Clinton's budget and it says um, we, we really have problems. And what I'm going to argue here is that if anything, things have, things have got worse in the past uh, 25 years. She was, she was very worried about it. Obviously, we have a huge opportunity. Uh, the uh, biggest science agency in the United States has highlighted the importance of the data revolution. In the private sector, the biggest and most important companies, the highest uh, valued corporations in the United States are data companies, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. So why are our public data systems struggling so much? Um, part of it is, you know, a lot of the uh, Data scientists can make a lot of money in the private sector more than they can make in the in the public sector. But I'm also going to argue that uh, we have a lot of problems that are being highlighted, I think, by um, the, the current crisis. Um, the organizational design in the United States, uh, anyone who has talked to Nancy Potok or uh, any of the chief statisticians will tell you that the challenges with the um, statistical system um, being housed in OIRA and OMB is a, is, is a problem. The way in which the funding is set up to support uh, programs is sadly uh, a challenge. And I just highlighted the, the salary structure. So, you know, we, we, the, the, the results are that we don't have the flexibility and the innovation to be able to deal with questions now where we've got um, questions about unemployment, about economic activity, and we need answers at the local level. Um, and, and that has very important consequences. Um, so for example, um, you know, there's been a lot of concern about 
uh, the way in which we measure unemployment, even if there's a, um, a, a there, there have been a number of errors in terms of classification, partly because it's a difficult concept. The, the, the measure of unemployment, for example, is actively looking for work. Um, and it may also be that the measures that we have are not the measures that we need at the state and local level so that workforce boards can figure out how much unemployment there is at the local area right now. Um, so, so it may be that we need new questions to complement the questions and the longitudinal sets uh, of questions that we've already developed. Um, it may be that we need to rethink our measurement. Um, we have GDP as a big number uh, that captures a lot of people's attention, but that's been criticized for ever since it was developed um, in terms of thinking through how, um, how, to, how to describe economic activity. So maybe we need to be rethinking uh, the measurement system that largely has come out of um, the Cold War and the Great Depression and rethink how we're trying to measure uh, uh, economic and social activity. And you know, the partnership between uh, universities and um, federal agencies and state and local agencies might very well be a way of going about that. Um, one of our biggest challenges, obviously, with the, with the federal system and, and government in general is, unlike the private sector, we worry a lot about privacy and confidentiality. Um, and of course, the, the challenge has been framed very much along the lines, whereas the private sector is fo laser focused on providing more accurate data so that you can figure out where to go and what to do. And um, what the federal system has done is gone down a direction of trying to um, um, reduce the quality of data and having an impact on, on research and policy analysis. So what we should be thinking about doing is thinking about how to use technology to collect and make use of data much better. See, I've only got about three minutes left, but um, the, the advantage of the cloud is that data don't have to be housed in one single agency. It's possible to share and access data across the board. And so we can use technology to do data collection and access and use better. Um, we can organize ourselves better. Uh, there's been a lot written on this. Lynn Ostrom obviously got the Nobel Prize for thinking about how can you make the best use of a public utility, a public good. Um, uh, the former uh, chief statistician, Nancy Potok, and uh, Nick Hart, who were responsible for the, um, uh, who was responsible largely for the Evidence uh, Act, uh, have proposed uh, FFRDCs, um, federally funded research data centers, as a quasi-government organization to, from which to work. How can we democratize data? Um, Frauker and I and Jody uh, have spent a lot of time building applied data analytics classes. Uh, putting data in the same place is necessary but not sufficient. You have to build the capacity for people to do that. Very inspired by the um, ag extension program in the United States, which grew out of similar problems. You had uh, farmers who had questions, just like now we have government agencies that have questions, and the bringing together of universities and the constituencies, in this case, government agencies that have questions, is very analogous to what happened in the, in the um, late 19th century. And so, um, we, we need to be engaging. And I think, again, the universities can help a lot with this. Um, we need to re-engage with states. Uh, we've been doing that, obviously, at the College Initiative that Frauke has been involved with and, and Jody, um, building ways and training programs and products that have values to, um, to, um, to build evidence um, with the people who are going to use it, with the, with the a direct connection with the users. Um, one of the visions that we have is like step number one is to build a secure environment. Step number two is to build the training programs. Step number three is to build a collaboration whereby 
the community provides information about what data sets are used by whom and use AI machine learning uh, approaches to build a, um, uh, an Amazon.com for data so that we can know for a given data set who's worked with it on what topics, with what results and with what other data sets, kind of like an Amazon.com and automate it rather than create a manual system. So I said I was going to give you my key ideas and uh, then tell you what I was going to tell you. Uh, so those are the, basically the ideas. We've got a lot of challenges. We need to have new institutional uh, structures to deal with it. We have the technology to do it. Um, and I think uh, something like the, the, this uh, center is, is, is right on the money. And uh, in a pathetic attempt to increase my sales, uh, there, the democratizing our data lays a lot of these ideas out. So thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. And once more, a reminder, if you have questions, go <coughs> to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Our third panelist today is Catherine Abraham. Catherine is a professor of economics and surveyed methodology, and her published research includes papers on the work and retirement decisions of older Americans, how government policies affect employers' choices concerning employment, and hours over the business cycle, effects of financial aid on the decision to attend college, discrepancies in alternative measures of employment, wages and hours, and measurement of economic activity. Catherine served as commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics from 1993 to, through 2001, and as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors from 2011 through 2013, and currently serves on standing academic advisory committees convened by the Con Congressional Budget Office, Bureau of Economic Analysis, and the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, I'm gonna hand it off to you, Catherine. Great, thank you very much. Let me uh, get my screen up here. So I also very much appreciate the opportunity to, to part of this panel. Um, my remarks will overlap to some extent with, with Julia's, though I think we also have a, have a different perspective on some of the issues associated with the production of information for economic decision making. I, I just start at the same place that Julia does, which is the existing model of, of data production in use at the, the Census Bureau. Uh, and I actually am going to turn my camera off if I can, because my internet connection is a little unstable. Um, the, the existing model of production at the Federal Economic Statistics Agencies clearly is under threat. Julia alluded to this. It's harder and harder to obtain survey responses from households and businesses. The statistical agency budgets are squeezed. The thing that I'm going to focus on is that the, the surveys that we have don't produce data of the desired frequency or the desired level of, of detail. From my perspective, where this leads me is that I think it's extremely important that the statistical agencies find a way to use administrative and private sector big data to complement the survey and census data uh, that are currently under underlie published economic statistics. I, I guess the place where I would take a, a little bit of an issue with Julia's perspective or degree, uh, disagree with her to some extent you know, comes with identifying where the problem is. I don't think the problem is that we're measuring the wrong thing. I think to the extent that we get data out of the current population survey on unemployment, it's generally a very high quality. I don't think there's a problem with producing GDP. It's a useful measure. It's not the only thing we care about. So I, I don't see the problem as lying primarily with the existing measures. Rather, I see the problem as lying with existing data not being available at the desired frequency, it does, they, they're not, they don't come out quickly enough, they're, they're not produced frequently enough, and they don't provide the desired level of detail. And I, thinking about this from the Federal Statistical Agency's perspective, that's where I would focus. This has really come to a head during the pandemic. People have wanted information sooner, they've wanted more detailed information, and in response, there has been a, uh, blossoming, uh, an explosion of research oriented towards producing 
more timely and more granular data. People are using payroll processing records, credit card data, checking account data, all in an effort to better understand what's going on now at the local level than we can learn from the official statistics. Just to give you a flavor of some of this work, and this I should say this is not my work, I've put the, the references to the, the papers that I'm drawing from here, one of the things that people have been very interested in during the pandemic is exactly what it is that's happened to employment and who it is that's been affected. There's a, a very interesting set of papers by a group of researchers at the Federal Reserve Board who've been using data from a payroll processing firm, ADP, to look at this and related questions. One of the things they've learned is that the impact of the pandemic on employment has differed a great deal across the income distribution with the jobs of high income people being relatively little affected and the jobs of low income people being greatly affected. There have also been some differences with women being more affected than men, which is not, not what you normally see uh, in, in a recession. Um, there have also been questions about what's happening to the demand for products and services. Uh, this is something else that people have been looking at. Again, trying to differentiate between those at the top of the income distribution and those at the bottom of the income distribution. Th this is a chart taken from Opportunity Insights, which has been looking at uh, credit card uh, and, and debit card data. Um, what they find is that over the course of the pandemic, people at the bottom of the income distribution have not actually reduced their spending all that much. But people at the top of the income distribution, who I just showed you, who aren't really being so affected in terms of loss of jobs and so on, have cut their spending a lot. That's a little surprising, but it makes sense when you start to zero in on where the reduction in spending has been occurring. It's been occurring in you know, hotels and food. It's been occurring in transportation. That includes the airlines. It's, it's been occurring in in-person services. And I think the message that you take away from this is that the reduction in spending and the resulting economy has not been a result of people didn't have money to spend. It's been a result of people can't spend money on the things that they would have liked to be spending money on. So that I, I'm showing you this just as an example of the way in which private sector big data can, I think, inform our understanding of what's going on in the economy. I thought I'd mention just briefly a project that I and a, a set of researchers in the Department of Economics at Maryland and the Maryland Transportation Institute in the College of Engineering have, have started working on. We're trying, we're maybe pushing the envelope here, but we're trying to figure out whether we can use anonymized geolocation data to better understand employment dynamics at a granular level. The Maryland Transportation Institute has already and he set up an existing infrastructure that has fused information from multiple sources to track trips that people make on an anonymized basis. They have information on about 100 million trips a day in the United States. Um, what we're trying to do in this new project is to use that information to better understand at a granular real-time level what's happening to employment. Our basic strategy is to develop algorithms that let us distinguish work trips from other types of trips. We're calibrating those numbers to official statistics in the baseline period. Um, we're using separate data on business locations to assign those work trips to industries. And then we will be monitoring changes in employment as implied by the TRIPS data over time. And in, in principle, if this works, we should estimates at the, at the county level. Um, obviously, there's a lot of, of challenges to overcome in getting to that point. We can talk about that more if, if we have time. But just thinking about the kinds of questions we might be able to answer, we should be able to look at whether people who have lost jobs in especially hard hit industries are taking jobs in other sectors. We can look at whether those are stopgap jobs or more permanent jobs. We can look at whether businesses that are closing down are being replaced by startups in the same area. 
Uh, we can look at whether people are, are changing geographic location, moving to other areas and, and get some insights into what it is that's, that's driving them. Uh, this is motivated, as I said, by the pandemic, but I think this data infrastructure will have a lot of continuing value even after the pandemic has, has passed. So I, I, I've talked about some private sector, you know, some you know, academic efforts um, that have been carried out you know, during the pandemic period, but I think the goal is not just to be engaging in research and in experimentation and, and you know, generating all of these different estimates. I think part of the goal is to incorporate these new approaches into official statistics to get to a point where official statistics can be more timely and be more. There are a lot of challenges to doing this and others have, have alluded to some of these, but let me just recap. Uh, one, pro there's a set of technical challenges. These data are not necessarily well designed for statistical purposes. Uh, new methodologies are needed to analyze them and turn them into statistics. There's a lot of issues associated with the arrangements for um, bringing, acquiring the data that are, are necessary. There's issues of cost. There's issues of continuity of access. Uh, there's concern on, in, in some quarters about data providers who might be feeding in a lot of the input that's underlying an official statistic having undue insight into what the published numbers are likely to be. There's issues of privacy and informed consent. And then there's a set of institutional issues and Julia talked at some length about those. There's issues related to the skill set of the, the federal workforce. There's issues related to the hardware and, and software infrastructure. And, and I would agree with her that there's issues associated with how the whole system is organized. It's, it's not really currently organized in the best possible way to push forward on incorporating these new methods into the production of official statistics. That said, I do know that the leadership of the federal statistical agencies are committed to meeting these challenges and, and finding ways to bring new approaches into the production of official statistics. And th that means there's a, an awful lot of opportunities for interesting work both inside and outside of government. And I, I look forward to being a part of SOTA and, and contributing to that work. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Catherine. And again, uh, if you have questions, please post them to the Q&A uh, uh, section. Or it's the button on the bottom of your screen. And we do have a question for Julia. Julia, uh, this uh, attendee is interested in your thoughts on citizen education to make sense of data and ideally be able to make his or her own independent evaluation of data. Could you share some thoughts on that? Oh, I love that question. That is so good. Um, yeah, so I think, I think that goes very much to, to the point here um, is that they, I think we're, we're seeing a sea change um, that to some extent, rather than having a high priesthood determine what is um, valuable to the consumer, um, which is, you know, is it accurate enough? Is it this or that? That we need to make the data available more to the community. In other words, the um, uh, maybe we care about timeliness, uh, where we can act immediately to get resources to people who are unemployed now at the at the local level maybe we uh, uh, care about um, providing very detailed data on subgroups uh, and so we want different ways of providing data that have access maybe we want to uh, understand the mechanisms whereby data are provided so in order to do that, that engagement of the community is, is really important. And I think the training component is critical. And again, that's where things like SOTA can, can uh, be important. Um, I agree, um, obviously, with Catherine's points that we really want high quality data. 
But the point is, is that the federal agencies have been recognizing these are problems for 25 years and they really haven't moved, right? So they keep getting hey, stuck. I don't agree with that, but let, let's. Well, yeah, <laughs> let's I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to push hard. Um, so the examples that you use were from researchers, um, and so what's happening is so much more of the market has been going to the public to 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 the private sector to produce things. And I think what I'm worried about is the lack of movement and the lack of engagement is going to lead to a er continued erosion of support. So one of the things that was so interesting about Janet Norwood's book when I went back and read it is the whole reason that we have the fragmented system. We have the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Bureau of Transportation, Energy, and so on, is each one of those was intended to be closer to its community, its use community. And that was a terrific idea, right? So how can we create that close link with the community and use technology to do so? And I think that's really what's important here. So I hope that answers the question from the floor. Catherine, did you want to share any? Yeah, I, yeah I did want to, to jump in. I mean, I, you know, I think the world has, has changed. And I, one thing I do agree with you that is on it, Julia, is that the current structure no longer makes sense. You know, the idea of having a separate Bureau of Labor Statistics, Census Bureau, Bureau of Economic Analysis, just really when we're, you know, trying to produce integrated statistics that are going to draw on the same sources of information and 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 so on it just doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, I, I think it was fine when what we were doing was surveys that could you know this is a survey about this that's a survey about that having the agencies separate didn't really make that much difference but at this point it makes no sense at all and we should have an, a single economic statistics agency in in my view. Um, but but in, in terms of the role of the statistical agencies, I think you're right that there has been this explosion of activity in the private sector, people you're producing a whole variety of different types of information. But every time I talk to the people who are doing that, what they will say is that they're benchmarking that information back to the official statistics. And without the official statistics as the backbone to the whole structure, I think we'd be lost. Oh, so, I absolutely agree. I didn't, I didn't disagree with that statement. I just said the data collect, we need to be much closer. We still have a really critical role for the federal statistical system to provide benchmarks, longitudinal consistency. Right. Uh, absolutely. Um, but I, I just don't see the, um, the creation of new products and ideas. There is, um, for, for all the kinds of funding reasons and organizational reasons, it's very difficult to innovate within the, within the current system. So finding out a way to get that innovation and uh, like Simon Kuznets with GDP and uh, uh, so, so many others, in integrating the innovation from the universities and think tanks and using that to inspire the federal statistical system rather than expecting the federal s system to solve all the problems. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe we're not disagreeing as much as I thought. I, I guess the, the point of disagreement is that I actually see more progress being made than it sounds like you do. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just don't. And, you know, we can go into the weeds, but... Uh, yeah, no, I, that, this is probably not the forum for going... No. <laughs> that, that gives me an opportunity. It, both of you guys were talking a little bit about, about uh, something that pivots back to what Laurie was talking about in terms of policy. And, and there is a question for Laurie, which is, which is how would you suggest that big data be employed for predictive methods for evaluating scenarios of impacts and outcomes of proposed technology policies? So, so thank you, David. Um, I'm actually going to um, segue from uh, a bit what Catherine and Julia were talking about, because um, to, to me, uh, your conversation encapsulates um, some of the challenges that we have that are not necessarily technical, but institutional, <laughs> and the structure of our institutions, as well as capacity um, within, the, within the agencies and within the, the federal system um, to do the sorts of things that David was asking me about, about 
you know, how do you, how do you take information that comes in through our official, through the federal government's official statistical um, agencies and from elsewhere, how do you take that and you use that not only to foreign policy, but, but to actually evaluate, um, you know, the impacts of policy, the, the, the impacts of, of action, how do you, how do you, how do you take some of those statistics and, and not just the, the statistics, but the data that's coming in from that? Um, you know, I think that the challenges, the opportunities, um, I believe it was Julia um, who spoke to, uh, actually, I think both Julia and Catherine spoke to the granularity of data uh, that we're able to get to now. And private sector is making greater use of that, um, from my observation. Um, than the public sector, but that's not to say the public sector isn't making use of that, but we've got more granular data. Um, we've got the opportunity for more granular, granular measures or indicators um, to be there, whether it's in terms of geography or um, sectors of the economy or different groups within the economy or various cuts of that, um, that we're able to track, we are technically um, have the capability of tracking that better. And because when we do that across jurisdictions, um, not just federal, but if we're, if, we're work, if we're able to work better in concert with states and state and local governments, then we're able to begin to look at possibly um, simulating impacts because we've got the data um, to mine and to look at and to begin to really pull out what are some of the predictive elements that, that led us to first, first order, secondary um, order, um, second order impacts. All of that is, is wonderful um, in, the, in the ideal, <laughs> but, but it all comes back to what I, I think, what, what I'm pulling out of um, as a core essence of the conversation that Catherine and Julia were just having, it all comes back to a lot of the capacity and structure of the federal government to actually be able to take advantage of that opportunity. Thanks, Lori. Uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna cycle back to something that 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 Catherine had talked about in your presentation. You described the process for understanding employment dynamics, and it involves some presumptions about the context in which the data can be analyzed. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you, but, but I'd like to get everybody's opinion. As more activities like this evolve, what are some of the security risks and what kind of governance structures need to be in place to ensure against introducing biases into the analysis as a result of those assumptions? Yeah, I, so I, I think this, this gets back to something Julia and I were, were talking about. If, if you think about all of these various sources of private data that people are exploiting to ex extract information from them. All of them have the property that they're not necessarily representative of the whole economy. So if you're looking at payroll processing data, it's the customers of that payroll processing firm, or if it's the uh, credit card data, it's people who have credit cards with that set of banks or, or whatever. So you worry that if people start paying you, too much attention to data generated from that sort of sources that it's going to be a biased representation of reality. So I, I think you, in my view of, of where we're headed, it should be you know, a, a world in which we have a backbone of information that other statistics can be calibrated to based on periodic censuses, a few surveys that are conducted at, at intervals, and that we fill in with model-based statistics based on these other sources of information that may or may not be fully representative. And to, you know, the, the, the integrity of the statistical agencies in, in developing representative, unbiased statistics serving as the anchor for other information that's generated that tells us about things that those other, you know, the federal data can't tell us about, seems like an important way to ensure that what we're getting is meaningful. I don't know if that answered your question exactly, but. I, I think it's a start, but I'd like to get everybody else's feedback as well. Maybe we'll go to Julia. Okay, so thank you, David. Um, so I guess I would come at it from the other way, and I, I, again, I talk about this in the book, which is that 
uh, where I think that we should, the way in which we, I think we should be thinking about this is not from a process point of view, but figuring out what are the questions that need to be answered um, and working backwards. So when I was interested, as Catherine well knows, building LinkedIn for employee data set in the United States, um, so we did this for the US, it combined um, large scale administrative records from all 50 states and six federal agencies. Um, and we, I also built one in New Zealand, the integrated data infrastructure. And so my original thought was, you know, wouldn't it be great to be able to combine all these data sets? And that turned out to be the wrong way of doing it. What I needed to start with is what are the questions that people in the local areas were interested in answering? Um, and John Thompson, who was director of the Census Bureau at the time, or deputy director, um, you know, trained me pretty well in saying, uh, so that. So what I uh, figured out, I went to just about every state in the country and talked with the workforce boards and so on. And what it turned out they were interested in was measures of employment dynamics at the local level that were timely and, you know, answered a set of questions. So I learned how to say the so that did the same thing in New Zealand. And out of that, what happened was um, it kind of came from the questions in order to get uh, answers that were consistent and high quality, you had to have a common data model. And that's where the federal agencies come in. Uh, developing a common data model, they were able to develop standard measures, but the questions came from like the farmers, the people who needed to answer questions in the fields, or in this case, state and local government agencies. So um, that, that's where I'm kind of uh, hitting. If, you, if you're interested in trying to figure out employment dynamics, ask first who wants to know the answer and why do they want to know it and where are the customers? And that's how you get the resources and the interest. Um, and it was the same thing with Simon Kuznets when he developed GDP. They wanted to figure out how bad was the Great Recession or the Great Depression. Um, and he was able to answer that question. So I think if we have a question-driven approach, rather than how can we produce high quality statistics approach, that's, I think, the mental flip that's needed. And it's very hard. But I, think, I think you have to have both. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. and I don't, I don't think that talking about the one in any way negates the importance of the other. It's a complementary set of activities. But here's where I'm worried is, the, the current system and the current organizational structure doesn't have the resources or the ability to maneuver quickly enough to answer those questions. And that's why I think what Nancy Potok and Nick Harp propose, which is an FFRDC, which is combines to some extent the long-term stability and the quality and the ability from universities to create a Manhattan project which is where, of course, the first national lab came. I mean, that, that's, sort of the, that's sort of the model that, that grew out of the work of the, and recommendations of the Commission on Evidence-Based right. Policy. And I, you know, I, I, I mean, again, it, it sort of sounds like you're saying the existing federal statistical structure is all screwed up. And I don't think that's quite right. I think, you know, what the FFRDC and the, the Commission on Evidence-Based Policy Making recommendations were all about was finding better ways to use the data that existed to address the questions that people cared about. But you need to have the basic statistical infrastructure. Correct. I, did, I said that what we needed to do was rethink the organizational system mm -hmm. and that if the current statistical system does not try to change the way in which it's organized, it's going to lose ground to the private sector. And uh, recognizing that there are institutional rigidities that prevent it from doing so, I don't think is, I think it's realistic. And so I think having things like the universities and a, rather than having universities be a carbuncle outside this, this statistical system, having an integration in the FFRDC approach is the way to do it. I guess I saw the FFRDC as filling a different role than the statistical agencies, but 
<laughs> I think yeah. what you guys have uh, surfaced is that this is a topic that might even warrant its own its own co full hour conversation. Since since I I also have a bunch of questions, uh, but I'm going to try to sublimate those to uh, to one of the questions that was uh, uh, brought up by another one of the attendees for uh, for Lori. Uh, is cybersecurity part of the uh, policy making that is within the the realm of what you were discussing earlier? Yes, um, yes, it is very much so, especially when you're when you're when you're focusing on technology policy. I I found myself so taken by um, I, if you if you will just allow me, I actually want to just make a brief comment about um, this whole idea of governance structures um, and, and the statistical agencies, and then I'll come back to um, the cybersecurity question. Um, and, and the thing that has, that has occurred to me both as a policymaker, as a researcher, and as a citizen, as an outside observer, is that um, we, have these, we have these statistical agencies that collect data for particular indicators and statistics that do form the backbone um, of, of how our economic system keeps track um, of, of its progress in many ways. But there are, there's also lots of data <laughs> elsewhere throughout the federal government and throughout local governments and throughout um, state governments as well, which in some respects, and, and we're not even talking about reaching out to um, you know, data that's available in social networks and so on and so forth that are, that are public in certain ways. Um, so there's a lot of found <laughs> data, if you will, um, that's available. Um, through public systems um, that could actually be put into service um, to do some of the things that we're talking about here in different ways. So I just want to put that on the table. That being said, um, yes, cybersecurity is a very, very important <laughs> part of this and a very important part of how we address our policies. Um, and, and that goes from not just what we think about as I, I would call it classic <laughs> cybersecurity in terms of um, hardening our systems in certain ways, um, ensuring um, the reliability of our software that drives um, many of the functions in our economy. Um, you know, not one, one of the major ones being not just the physical infrastructure of the electric power system, but some of the software that goes um, to, to run that. Um, but there's also um, the integrity um, of the information and access to the information and who has access to information that is um, at the moment somewhat widely available but has been put in the trust of and the care of um, some of our federal systems. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we want to be looking um, to, to that as well. And we want to, this is kind of tying back to one of the earlier comments that was made uh, with respect to citizen education, um, education um, in general about um, cybersecurity, care of data, access to data, um, extending that into data privacy, um, by both uh, you know, having that training and education, that mindset and that sensibility built into um, the civic discourse, is very, very important to us because we know in any, um, in any organization, <laughs> the weakest link in cybersecurity is, are, is always the people, right? Um, and so you can, you can take care to build certain, certain types of uh, trust and authorization into your systems. Um, and yet um, it just takes that one person um, to open the breach uh, and for there to be uh, a major incident. Um, and I'm also thinking of that in terms of um, this, this is kind of on my mind. I've got a 13 year old right now who is having, who has a civics class um, actually at her school and is learning what it means to be an engaged citizen. And as an engaged citizen in, in the US context, um, Engaged citizens need a better understanding of what data is telling us and what data is doing for us as citizens of this country. That's a totally different learning experience 
Um, and it's not something that I think we all, even those of us who are kind of working in these areas, that we all have a grasp on. Um, and how does that affect the security of our systems, of our data, um, of our um, economic structure, which depends on all of those systems as well? So I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you. We're at the end of our time. So I want to thank all of our panelists for their insights today. And I'm going to hand it back to SOTA co-director Brian Butler. Thank you very much to Julia, Lori, Catherine, and David for, for the discussion today. Did a great job of showing the complexity and challenges underlying the data that we rely on in everyday life and that people often take as being simple uh, or straightforward when the reality is creating that is not so much. Um, and tomorrow we'll be uh, returning to similar discussions specifically around privacy, the issues of privacy that arise and get, that were alluded to a little bit today um, and certainly came up yesterday in the discussions of health uh, with a panel of folks from the iSchool, from BSOS and from Facebook. Um, so we hope you'll join us tomorrow at 11 o'clock um, and thank you very much. If you'd like more information about the Social Data Science Center, you can go to our website at socialdatascience.umd.edu um, or contact us. Um, and in particular, if you're interested in, in any of these events, knowing more about it, please feel free to contact us. Or if you're interested in the possibility of becoming a Soda Center affiliate. Thanks for organizing. Thank you Great discussion. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.